Hey, Adam, how are you doing? I couldn't be better. Thanks for asking. So Adam is uh, Adam and I are going to talk about a very controversial topic, and I think it's of a lot of relevance uh, in all that is happening in the climate today. Adam is a vascular surgeon at the Medical University of South Carolina, but I'm going to let him introduce himself a little bit more. And um, so, Adam, tell me a little bit more about yourself. Yeah, absolutely. First of all, thank you so much for having me and inviting me. This is a uh... As a lot of your guests have said, uh, you know, it's kind of an awesome thing you've taken on. And I just wanted to congratulate you because I think you're having some really awesome and fun conversations on this platform that I, I'm just really proud I get to be a part of. So thank you. Thank um, you. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Um, so as you said, my name is Adam Tanius. Um, originally from Los Angeles, uh, went to undergrad in Baltimore um, and then went to medical school in Michigan and then started my training in Tampa, Florida and finished my training in Boston, Massachusetts. Um, and this is my first job out as an attending uh, here in South Carolina. So I've just about completed my third year. So, you know, kind of a big milestone there. Um, and, you know, I have different interests, but one of the main interests uh, that I've had since I started being really ever since college, but really took on full force when I became an attending was sort of the concept of business entrepreneurship and how business and medicine interact. And so to that end, I actually got my MBA um, during my first and second year as an attending here. Um, and I would say that that really kind of spurred a lot of the, I guess, really the the thought process behind what went into my, my talk and sort of where I am trying to sort of point my career uh, and talking about this, as you said, kind of controversial topic. Mm -hmm. So I have to, you know, you obviously are younger and wiser than I am because I decided or chose to do my MBA almost 10 years after <laughs> starting practice. I'm currently in the process. Man, oh. uh, it's, it's so funny. There are so many crossroads between business and medicine that we are unfortunately not taught during medical school or residency or fellowship or any of that. Um, you know, so do you, did you, I think of it did you see it the same way yeah i mean i so i you know if i was smart i would have loved to have done a combined mba md program but it wasn't it wasn't offered or i i was just i may not have you know known as uh, ahead enough to apply but i always thought it was something i wanted to do once i kind of got through medical school and just saw how much business was involved in medicine and i you know i'm sure in your world in the interventional cardiology space it's clearly you know prevalent in the vascular surgery space, clearly prevalent. And I think that, you know, it's almost as I'm sure you can appreciate it's, it's, a, it's a foreign language and you have to sort of understand it to be able to converse and, and speak knowledgeably about the different facets of how business and medicine interact or business in, of itself. And so I came from a very business oriented family. And so uh, you know, being the the black sheep of the family where I was the one talking about medicine when my family would stare at me with like I had three heads and then they would talk about business and I'd stare at them like they had three heads. <laughs> I decided I wanted to sort of bridge that gap and gain that knowledge so that I could, you know, be, uh, you know, come to the table as a as a equal participant. Um, and then it really sort of helped me launch what I think is going to be sort of my future in medicine, which is trying to mix these worlds in as best a way as possible. You know, that's, I cannot, uh, every time I talk to someone, it's so, it's, it's really surprises me to see so many commonalities, right? So like how you were the black sheep in your family, I was the complete black sheep in my family. Uh, I have two brothers, both of them are not in medicine, they are in business and all everything but medicine. And I was like, you know, and when I was Every family conversation was business, this, this project, that project, and there'll be no conversation about what I am doing or something like that. And I kind of the thought of medicine or business school only because the amount of uh, takeover by the sea suit, which is happening in the world of medicine. And I honestly wanted to have a conversation with them in their own terms. Like, you know, uh, now I speak a language they don't understand, but I can speak their language. And I wanted to kind of even out the terms. And I think you're absolutely right. We have to change the way the future generation of doctors are being trained because it's so unfortunately business is mi uh, mixing with medicine and the onus is going to be upon us to help navigate that because we leave it to the business people, they're going to screw it up.
that's my take two cents on it. Yeah, I mean, I think it, it, it's it's like anything, right? I mean, I have a passion for innovation, right? And there are a lot of places where, you know, they will have engineers come to the operating room to evaluate where they see inefficiencies and then go and try and fix those inefficiencies or fix problems. But why shouldn't it be the surgeons and the interventionalists who are the ones asking for the solutions to the problems they face? That's where I find the best solutions come in, right? And so I think it's just like business. If we as physicians don't get involved in the conversation, we're going to get left behind. And I, you know, selfishly, whenever I go to the table to have conversations about the business aspect of my job, I wanted to make sure that I understood what was being said. And I wanted to make sure that people were hearing the message I wanted to give in the way, right? Because people only hear things when it's spoken in a language they understand. And so I wanted to make sure that I was effectively communicating the things that were important to me. Um, and then I found that there were so many other avenues that business and medicine interact that I just kind of, it just sort of unraveled. And you're absolutely right. I mean, I think that it's almost, it almost should be, you know, if, you, if it's interesting, I'm sure you've seen this, but you know, if you look at dental school, dental students actually get business curriculum as part of their education. And I think that it's fascinating that we as medical students, there is not one iota of business education in any part of medicine. And it, I, it's just criminal. Yeah. I mean, one of the first sessions in my business school was product designing. Okay. And the professor who came and taught us product designing was working with doctors. Then I'm sitting there and thinking, why was this not taught to me during business, uh, medical school or even cardiology yeah. fellowship or medicine? Why am I sitting in an MBA program and yep. uh, thinking about how to design a product? I should be, this should have been in the forefront of, um, you know, my life when I'm, when I'm dealing with all these calcified or blockages yep. and things like that. It's, and I, I actually went back to my professor and said, you need to come and talk to my colleagues and give grand rounds or something so that they get a glimpse of what, you know, we are exposed to and kind of honestly build bridges between these two very diverse, but extremely colliding kind of uh, uh, worlds. Extremely well said. Yeah. And I think that, I, I think that once we start as, and I think that we have to start demanding it, right? I mean, I think as physicians, we have to start demanding it or else we're just going to, you know, because we get caught up in the race of how many cases can we get done or how many patients can we see and how many, you know, I think that, and, and for, you know, I guess for good reason, right? We have lots of patients that need care and we're trying to take care of all these sick people that need us. But I think that if we take a minute and, and try and integrate these different facets of our lives, it's only going to help more patients in the long run Absolutely. and it's only going to make the system more efficient. And so I think we just, we have to demand it. Absolutely. You know, I recently came across your TEDx talk. Congratulations, by the way. Thank you. And Thank it you. Was fabulous. It was very interesting. And uh, I, I want you to kind of walk me through it. Like, why did you decide to give this talk on this specific topic? I would encourage everyone to listen to Adam's TEDx talk. We will put the link in the bottom of our show notes. So please listen to it. It's actually very interesting. And I have a story to share at the end of it. But tell us about your TEDx talk. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you. That's, that's extremely kind of you to say. Um, a lot of me went into that talk. So I, I take a lot of pride. And it was a, it was a, it was quite the adventure. Um, but, you know, it's kind of, I, you know, for anybody who has listened to it or anybody who will listen to it, you know, the, the story goes that, I, you know, as you, we've kind of said, I was raised in a business family, right? My father was the salesman of all salesmen. Um, he, and, and I studied him, right? You, like you study your parents and you learn them and you, you know, right? And so I would study how he interacted and how he did things and how we would have family dinners with his co-workers who were really clients, but he made them friends and how that made his business so successful. And we enjoyed a very wonderful life because he was so successful in business. And then I got into medicine and it was very clear that, you know, he was a salesman that his job translated to the medical sales reps that I interacted with on a daily basis when I was in the operating room. And mm. it was striking to me to see how prevalent of a place medical sales had in our field. And that's any interventional, especially I would say, right? Surgical, interventional, what have you. Um, and then lo and behold, married my wife, who is 
you know, as a surgeon, probably it's unfortunate how ethical she is. Um, she really, <laughs> she really keeps my, she keeps my moral compass pointed due north, you know, thank God for her because otherwise who knows where it would point. Um, but it was, it was a critical moment in my training where as a trainee, and I, and I'm, I'm saying this openly because I, I, I'm not trying to lie, but as a trainee, I love the idea of rep dinners. I love the idea of getting a free meal by a company who was going to put really cool attendings in a room to teach me really cool things. And I was going to get a steak dinner with wine I'd never buy for myself, right? And I was going to get to do it on somebody else's dime when I was making the government salary that residents make. And it was something I looked forward to, right? And I know that a lot of my colleagues and my residents all look forward to the same thing. And my wife cornered me and asked me, there's something wrong with this picture, isn't there? Because they're going to be in the operating with you tomorrow after the dinner they're paying for tonight, right? And in my mind, I, I never connected those dots. I said, this is just life. This is how things happen. This is how we move the needle forward. And it wasn't until I was the attending surgeon in the operating room that I realized, oh, wait, there can be another side to this interaction that I didn't appreciate. And that's what kind of led me to the TED Talk. And it, there was also, I'm not sure if you read, but there was a very poignant New York Times article in June or July of 2023 that talked about some physicians who were abusing the outpatient-based lab atherectomy oh, services. Yes, I've read that um, article, yes. And, and so I read that article after being an attending for about a year and a half and having that conversation with my wife and everything sort of, and I had just finished my MBA program. And so everything kind of just clicked. And it just was one of those, I don't know, perfect storms of a moment where I, I just sort of had this awakening. I was like, we need to talk about this. Nobody talks about this. Why can't we have a conversation about this? And again, as, as people will hear or have heard in my TED talk, I don't think it's all negative. And I don't think I would have saved as many people's lives if I've saved if I didn't have surgical reps in the operating room with me. But I do think it's something we need to have a conversation about. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, um, you know, you shared a very, very interesting story in your TED Talk. Um, I mean, should we take the suspense away or are you? Yeah, go for it. it. Absolutely. Yeah. It was a beautiful story. And I think every interventional person or a surgeon has a story like that. There was a moment, there was a gap, a knowledge gap. And then someone who's not physician fixes that gap for you and the patient is saved. And I, in your own words, I would love to rehear that uh, story. It was a beautiful story. Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, it was a patient who came in with a ruptured abdominal aortic aneurysm. And so this after... Is a talk for non-medical people. So, let's go with what is an abdominal aneurysm. Oh, perfect. All of that absolutely. Is. So, so patient came in with a bleeding, the major blood vessel of the body, the aorta, that gives blood to all the different organs in our body. When it gets into your belly, it has a high tendency to burst in people that have certain risk factors, smoking, hypertension. And this patient's aneurysm, had, this patient's artery had grown into an aneurysm. And aneurysms are basically when the walls of the artery become bigger than they're supposed to. And when that happens, just like a balloon, the walls get weaker and weaker until they become too big and then they can burst. And when they burst, especially this artery in the belly, patients have essentially a 50% chance of surviving if they make it to a hospital. A lot of these patients won't even make it to the hospital. So this patient showed up to a community hospital in a rural town, and they diagnosed them with a burst aneurysm in their belly. And at that point, they called me and I accepted the patient in transfer. And as soon as that patient landed, I explained to the patient and his wife that he was in a, he was in a bad way and that this artery in his belly that had basically fallen apart and burst, if we did not fix it, would eventually take his life. And we had two ways of fixing it. We could do it in a minimally invasive way that would have a lower chance of complication and would keep him in the hospital a much shorter amount of time, but would likely require frequent touch-up surgeries and monitoring or a maximally invasive surgery that has a higher chance of complication and would also require much longer stay in the hospital. But 
was probably a more durable option. Mm -hmm. Um, And the patient sort of decided because of some life circumstances that he needed to be out of the hospital as fast as possible because he wanted to walk his daughter down the aisle for a wedding. And so once I kind of had that conversation with the patient and his wife, I decided we would do the minimally invasive surgery. Um, But in these instances, you know, to fix patients with these burst blood vessels, you have to place a stent on the inside that is essentially directing blood flow away from where the artery is broken. Mm -hmm. Um, And you have to have certain sizes that fit the shape of the patient's anatomy. And we don't keep all of those specific sizes stocked in some back closet somewhere, right? And so you have to call your sales rep in and they literally see thousands of these cases a month. I mean, they're running around states and territories, deploying these devices in thousands of people. And when it comes time for you to need one of those devices to treat your patient, um, it, you know, I would say it's standard practice, if possible, to have one of those reps available to assist you. Because again, you know, for anybody who is in surgery or interventional specialties, you're really orchestrating quite the chaos in the operating room, right? I mean, it is a chaotic situation, especially when patients aren't doing well. When patients are sick or doing poorly, there tends to be a little bit more energy. There tends to be a little bit more sort of, um, I don't know what the right word to say is, but a little bit more sort of adrenaline, a little bit more tension in the air, right? And so to have the ability to offload a little bit of information to people who are experts at it, right? So our anesthesiologists, they are responsible for the anesthesia care of the patient, right? Our surgical circulators are responsible for knowing where everything is, right? Our scrub techs are responsible for knowing the instruments so they can hand. Having a device representative present that knows the ins and outs of this device so that I can think about all the other 10 million things to try and keep this patient safe in the operating room. I think it's just an amazing tool and advantage to have when they're present. And so I invite them to the operating room to also bring the specific stents we need. Um, and so in this particular instance, when I put in the stent that would seal off that rupture, it, it didn't deploy correctly. Um, it actually got stuck. And after, you know, a millisecond of panic, I, uh, I, I looked to my device rep who was extremely calm. I mean, unprecedentedly calm for the situation, right? And remember, I'm a young attending. I was only out of training about three, six months at the time. And so, you know, there's a lot of, you know, psychological factors going on. And at, when I looked to them, they very calmly and coolly told me exactly what to do because they'd seen it happen twice before. And I trusted them. I trusted them. I did exactly what they said. And their stent ended up deploying perfectly. And the patient made it off the operating table. And as I say in the talk, they probably never realized just how close to death they probably came. Um, but it, you know, if it wasn't for that sales rep in the room that day, we may have had a very different outcome. And so. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, that's, you know, every time I hear it, it, it's such an amazing moment. It's, there are these teeny tiny moments, which changes, has a ripple effect, such a big ripple effect. And people don't know about the individual players of that ripple effect, right? It was Adam Tanius, the rep who was present, who all made it a, a possible for that patient to walk his daughter down the aisle of 10 days later. And, you know, these are the hidden forces uh, um, kind of orchestrating things behind the scenes in a very, very silent way. You know, yeah. I have a similar story about actually my whole, you know, when I started practice in medical university, uh, we, as you know, there are already structural spe- specialists, peripheral guys, and you guys were already there. So I was a little bit of an often without my own niche speciality, okay? And that kind of was truly bothering me and itching me and annoying me a lot. And uh, then one of those uh, uh, device company guys came to me and said, hey, why don't you look into opening chronic total occlusions? Blood vessels, which are blocked 100% of the time, happen so slowly that patients don't even realize it. Lots of people are doing it. There's no one in South Carolina doing it or even... There are dabblers, but you know, why don't you take it on? And, and I literally was, um, 
afraid to open that box of uh, CTOs because it's such a complex procedure, yeah. most aggressive, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, I don't know about that one. He's like, no, 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 just come for a course, come for a course, give it a shot, give it a try. And honestly, you know, that changed my life. I went to Chicago, took the course. Uh, the company bought practice to teach me. And we do like three to four of them a week now in Charleston, uh, MUSC. I mean, and it's again, like the ripple effect of the number of people's life, which was changed because of that. Uh, it's quite unbelievable. I think relationships with industry, as you had mentioned in your talk, needs to be transparent. And we need to have yeah. the end game that we are here to benefit the patient, be upfront and clear uh, in our messaging. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's a beautiful story, right? Because I think that, you know, I mean, we just have to be open about what the situation is, right? These are for-profit companies that answer to, you know, they don't answer to patients. They answer to their shareholders, right? They answer, right? I mean, Students of business, right? You have to understand what company, right? I mean, if we we're talking about nonprofit companies, not for profit companies, completely different story. But these are for profit companies. So they have very different interests. But at the same time, they also have resources that we don't have. I mean, I can't tell you how much learning I have been a, a privilege to or have had a privilege to have from courses just like that, where I learn from experts in the field across the country because industry puts them in the same room for me to pick their brain and understand how they do something as opposed to just being allowed to learn from the seven to 10 attendings at my training program, right? Not to say that that is a bad thing, right? That the attendings that train you at training programs are all fantastic and you get a diverse array of knowledge, fine. But if you can open up the nation, the world of experts in a specific field, because industry is willing to put them in the same room and you just have to understand what is the, the, the sort of the cost benefit analysis of taking that invitation from industry. That's wonderful. As long as you are at least being open about it, right? Like that's it. But why would we deny ourselves that opportunity for that education? You know, the funny thing here is also right. Uh, most of the complications we deal with are different procedures. Somebody else has dealt with it or has suffered with and learned from it in different views, in different things. The wheel has kind of been invented, but no one is communicating about the different problems which they encountered. And when industry puts all of these people in a room, that's what we are learning. Oh, you, so this is a complication of this. Huh. Okay. Now I understand what happened. Okay. Fine. Now I, I know how to better handle it. If it happens. I'm sure you've uh, you had situations like that. Yeah. I mean, we even in vascular surgery, there are specific courses that are put on that talk about sort of my worst cases, right? Or, yes. and again, it, and it's not, it, it, you know, I think that it may, to a lay person or somebody who's non medical, it may sound a little bit, I don't know, um, crass that we talk about these things, but really I think you, people have to understand that this is our ultimate objective, especially as physicians, is to learn as much as we can to help as many patients as we can. And if we can take time in a classroom, in a lecture hall somewhere so that we don't have to learn the hard way or by making our own mistakes, but learn from somebody else's mistakes and especially in this day and age of society where we're so interconnected with different forms of social media, et cetera. I mean, again, the problem is, is that, and I mean, again, if you really want to get into this, why aren't our hospitals footing the bill for this kind of thing? Why aren't our medical societies footing the bill for these more common things? I mean, again, you know, right now, the people who are footing the bill for it are industry and I have to be thankful to them for it. Now, maybe eventually we'll, the hospitals and medical societies will say, no, 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 we're going to foot the bill for this because we find it so important. But that doesn't mean we should deny ourselves that education if it's being presented to us. And maybe we should advocate that hospitals and our societies do more and more of this so that it's free of influence from for-profit companies. But if we as physicians have knowledge and understand what it means for somebody from a for-profit company to put something like this on and what the interactions are and if there are any untold expectations, etc. from that world of business, as long as you go in eyes wide open about that, why would I deny my future patients that potential knowledge because I'm worried about what it means to have industry sponsor something? I just don't think it's worthwhile. 
And, you know, sometimes, you know, even if I have a, one particular company who provides a stent um, in my uh, cat lab, after I've done my intravascular imaging and I think, oh, I need a different size stent, which is not in that company size, I'm like, hey, I'm sorry, I'm not going to, you know, put two stents just to be loyal to your company. I'm going to do what's best for my patient. And, and I'm open about that. And so that to me right there, that I think is the crux of the education that we need to be imparting to our future surgeons and interventionalists, right? Because that is where I think the where it gets a little bit of a gray area. Because if we don't train our residents who are influenceable, right? I mean, think about it, right? You're making residents fellow salary and you have these big companies that are spending lots of money on you to go lots of places that are fun that you never go to yourself. And then they start telling you all these different things. And if you don't have people who are your attendings teaching you, listen, just because they've done these things for you, there is no obligation. Your obligation is to the patient. Your obligation is to make sure you do what you feel most comfortable with and what you think is ethically and medically appropriate to do. Just because they bought you dinner does not mean you have to put in their stent. If putting in their stent is the right thing to do, wonderful. If putting in their stent is not the right thing to do, thank them for the dinner and do exactly what you need to for the patient. But if we don't have that conversation openly, I worry that the future generations of interventionalists and surgeons are going to have a hard time understanding where those lines are. And that's one of the main reasons why I gave that talk. Because I think patients need to understand what's going on with business and medicine and why they have to be transparent with us so we can do right by then. But also as surgeons and interventionalists, we need to make sure we're training the next generation appropriately so that they are not caught up in the business side of things that they haven't been taught. Yes. And the thing is, like, technology is evolving. It's evolving in a rapid place, a rapid pace. Even if you have, you know, trained in the best fellowship program, literally one or two years after your fellowship, there's new technology, and you're not in a place where you can, you know, take off a year to go get trained again. So you have to squeeze time, and that's another valuable place. Like so many courses uh, given by industry, or even I take my fellows to and said, you have to learn this technology because it's going to become your bread and butter more than mine. Like, you know, I think fellow education and attending education too, like intravascular ultrasound came much later in uh, um, uh, in, in my training even, right? Uh, when yeah. I was doing my fellowship, there's one attending who did intravascular ultrasound in the blood vessels of the heart. Nobody mm-hmm. else was doing it. So obviously I cannot, he cannot be the only one teaching. So we all had to go out and learn and, you know, things, yeah. it, it's, it becomes very difficult otherwise to keep up with yeah. the uh, in, in my first year as an attending, there was a technique that I'd never really done or experienced before. And industry put together a course about how to perform this technique. And it's now one of the most ready tools in my arsenal. And I've saved a lot of people open big bypass surgeries and have been able to treat them with wires, balloons, catheters, and stents because I've learned this technique. But that would have never happened if industry hadn't put in the bill for a course that I got to go to in my first six months as an attending. And yeah, it, it, you know, again, you just, there are so many wonderful opportunities for us to partner. Again, I just want the goal of that TED talk, the goal of this sort of message that I'm trying to put out there is that we all need to be open about what our objectives are in this interaction, because we, we have different goals And we have different things we answer to as the entities, right? The physician medical entity versus the business entity. And you just have to realize that while they may have very similar or shared interests, ultimately, each group has its own particular interests. And I think the overwhelming message is if the relationship you have with your doctor, the trust should come from your doctor is going to do what's right for you. And it does not matter who's bought the dinner or something like that. I mean, it, that is irrelevant. It just, it doesn't matter. Your doctor will do the right thing for you. And that's the relationship every patient should have with their doctor. If not. Right. And, <laughs> and exactly. And, and I think that the, the a part for the patients, because, you know, during that, giving that TED talk, I think the hardest part of giving that was trying to make 
the the non-medical public understand why it's an important topic. And the point that I wanted to bring across to the non-medical public is that you as patients need to be transparent with your physicians about what your wants and needs are. Because if you tell us what's important to you, then it gives us the ability to do the best by you, right? So if that patient had told me, doctor, listen, I don't care how long I have to stay in the hospital. I don't care if I have some hiccups along the way. I never want to have another surgery again. I want to have as long of a life with this repair as absolutely possible. I would have never called in a device rep. I would have never, I would have done an open surgery for them and there would have been no worry about well, whose device I decided to put in, et cetera, et cetera. I would have done a completely different surgery for them. And so that's really it. I think patients just need to realize that as physicians, we just need to know what we want to be good stewards of their care. Yes. So when they are transparent with us, it affords us the ability to be good stewards of their care and make decisions that are in their best interest. Unfortunately, like anything, you know, everything is neutral and you can use it uh, on a positive aspect, which is what you and I are talking about. And unfortunately, industry relationships have been abused, abused in the past, abused in the present, and unfortunately will be abused in the future. And I think, you know, it's, it's like any good thing and it kind of the onus falls on you as a human being, why you became a doctor and what you are in it for and who is your primary priority. And, the industry too. What does industry gain from these courses? Number one, yes, they are all they are making more people use it. Yes, they get profit, but there is also some sort of a goodwill, intangible uh, goodwill factor which comes to them also, right? That they are proving um, or helping patient education, or they are talking about physician education, which adds as a plus for them too. Absolutely, and I think you just. Again, you just have to realize, and you know, I, I try and tell my residents this, right? Like, you know, I think if an industry representative wants to take you out to dinner or buy you coffee to talk to you about something, go for it. Don't you know? This, this my whole my whole mantra is not to say no to everything or be afraid or be, but the idea is that just understand that there can be bad with the good, and understand that because there, you know, a free a, a free cup of coffee is never free. Right. Absolutely. And no we're, free we're lunch in life. <laughs> there's no free lunch. And, you know, you just have to realize like we're human beings, right? If somebody buys you a cup of coffee and asks you about your family and your kids by name because they remembered it from the last time they talked to you, and then they happen to be in the operating room with you when you encounter disease that just so happens to be able to be treated by a device that they sell, we're human. It's human nature that you're going to think about the device that they sell being able to fix the problem. And I can promise you that the stent or the balloon or the thing you're going to put in costs way more than the cup of coffee or the dinner that was bought for you. (laughs) And But again, but not to the discredit of the industry sales rep who's there. It's just you have to understand. And again, as you and I know, having studied business, there are tactics to sales. And we just have to understand that. That's all. Yes, yes. And yes, the more vocal we are about it, I think it is better both for the patient and the uh, industry people who come because they also, you know, sometimes industry people have gotten kind of frisky, frisky in the sense, oh, are you going to put my stent? I'm like, no, I'm going to put the stent my patient needs, not what the stent you are telling me to do. So we have to draw those limitations of, like everybody else. Boundaries yeah. are important. And I, and I do have to say, I've been, I've been very lucky to have been blessed with working with some amazing sales reps who literally will grab competitors' products and bring them in the room when they know that it's the right thing to use. And again, I, you know, I think, you know, you just have to, you just have to understand that sometimes that relationship cannot be positive. So I, I just know that I've surrounded myself and have been blessed to have really amazing reps who, really want to learn and work with me and be a partner in patient care, which is absolutely amazing. And I'm sort of spoiled. And I know that we here at MUSC are very spoiled in that. I, I, oh I feel God, like yes. I hear that. I, I feel like I hear that from so many different people and in, in different departments. But that's not to say that it can't be different other places. And I just think that there should be, we should just be discussing it. Yes. I To your point, I kind of feel like pay, uh, people self-select, okay, when they interact with you, they're like, oh, I'm this is not going to work with me, so I'm not going to work with this doctor. And I'm like, fine by me. But 
like you, I have been so lucky to have been surrounded by people who will, you know, this is the right thing to do. You should be doing this. No questions asked. And will bring me the alternate technology or alternate atherectomy catheters or balloons or devices because that's what the patient needs. And that's always the bottom line. And it was funny. I was, you know, I gave, I gave the talk and I, I'll be honest with you. I was nervous about what the response was going to be from a lot of my industry partners because I consider a lot of them friends. And it was surprising how overwhelmingly positive and appreciative people were. I mean, people were so gracious and they, you know, I was like, okay. And I guess, I, again, as you said, we sort of self-selected and we're pretty lucky with a group of people we get to work with. But yes. it was funny how many people in industry actually really enjoyed the message as well. Because I think for by and large, they all want the same things we want because their products are successful when patients do well with their products, right? Absolutely. And so, yes, it, 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 you know, it, it, there, is symbio- there is a symbiosis to this sort of relationship, right? Yes, yes. All right, Adam. Thank you so much. I know you had a very long day in the OR today and you still managed to make some time to do this. Yeah. Before we finish, you know, there's a little uh, uh, a fun side to this thing. Yeah. Uh, the name of the podcast is Reboot with Dr. R.C. Marin. So I want to ask you if you have a personal story, yet another personal story of uh, rebooting for yourself. Yeah, uh, you know, I'm gonna I'm gonna bring up my wife again, um, and so uh, you know, my wife and I actually we met and we were in different medical schools at the time. So she's a pediatric anesthesiologist here at MUSC, um, and so I was in training in Florida, um, and she matched into her top residency program um, in Boston, um, and so we got married and were long distance married for a year, mm-hmm. and. Um, after a year of being married long distance, I realized that for the sake of our future and our relationship, something had to change. Um, and so I, at that point, um, reached out to my program director and asked him if he would be okay with allowing me to see if there were opportunities for me to transfer my training. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I ended up reaching out to programs in Boston and got extremely fortunate that the, the vascular surgery team at uh, Massachusetts General Hospital just happened to have a spot because of the way the residence education was staggered. Um, and they ended up accepting me. And so I basically picked up and left everything um, after four years in Tampa to go and complete four more years of training in Boston. And I mean, for anybody who's been through training, I'm sure you'll appreciate that you know, I was about to enter my chief years uh, in my training in Tampa and all of those long nights and all the goodwill and all the hard work that I had put in to sort of enjoy the the fruits of my labor and being a chief that hopefully people trusted and enjoyed working with. I had to restart that. Um, (laughs) And so, yeah, I had to basically go to Boston and just earn my, my reputation and my name of what, who I am and who I was as a trainee all over again. And I did. And I will tell you that I, you know, I just was so incredibly fortunate to have come from such an amazing program in Tampa, Florida, and then to go to an amazing training program in Boston. And I, I mean, it was just, I, I, I don't think anybody's been luckier in training than I have just because of it. But that was a pretty, that was a pretty challenging time in life, just having to sort of basically restart, right? And, you know, a lot of people are used to restarting when they're becoming attendings, Mm -hmm. but to restart as a resident in their chief years of training, that was a, that was a, yeah. 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 That's a, that's the things you do for the, in the name of love. Yeah, that's right. That's right. (laughs) You know, Rana, uh, my husband, Rana had to do something. He was a transplant fellow Mm -hmm. And we got married and then, um, you know, I was like, I'm, I have to do my training so you cannot get up and leave now. So on June 30th, he was transplant fellow. And on July 1st, he was intern in general surgery, the same hospital. (laughs) That was a pretty brutal. Oh, Yeah. That, I mean, I thought, okay, you know what? He wins. I, I I have got nothing at least. (laughs) Yeah. He wins. At least I didn't have to be, you know, I didn't have to go back and redo intern year, but that is a, uh, <laughs> you know what, like you said, the things we do in the name of love. And I, you know, I would, I do it again. I do it again every, any chance I got, but it was, you know, as I'm sure he would explain, it was just, you know, that 
that feeling is just, you know, it's just a, yeah, it's, a, it's, it's so a, much uncertainty. Yeah. I wouldn't want him to do it ever again. I think <laughs> after seeing that year, nep, nep, no, we'll figure out yeah. some other way. Yeah. <laughs> Anyways. All right. Awesome. Adam, thank you so much. And it was such uh, a pleasure. We will link your, um, uh, uh, TEDx talk and also your LinkedIn profile and ways for people to find you as well. Okay. So appreciated. And again, congratulations. This is such thank an awesome you. thing you're doing. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much for listening. If you found us valuable, you can subscribe to the show on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or any of your favorite podcast app. And also, please consider leaving us a rating or a review as that helps others find the podcast too. I hope you have a great week ahead.